right. Hello and welcome to the Dragonfly Daily. I am your host, Mike, the product manager for Dragonfly at ORS. You can follow me on Twitter at Dragonfly Wizard. Today's lesson, lesson number seven, working with shapes. So if you are watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. What is it down here? Hit that subscribe button so that we can keep these active and we can have a lot of good attention on these and continue to do more webinars. Lesson seven, working with shapes, we'll be using Dragonfly 4.1 today. So we're no longer using the out of the box experience for Dragonfly 4.1. We're now using the customizations that we applied in lesson six. So you should be able to keep up even if you don't customize, but if you say, hey, how come Mike's interface looks different from mine? It's because Mike followed the instructions in lesson six and did those customizations, changing the background color, changing the workspace where you have modules in different places, et cetera, et cetera. So the agenda for today, working with shapes, we're gonna talk about shapes, which include cylinders, capsules, boxes, spheres and planes. We will look at cylinders using cylinders to um, first change the coloring or lookup table of part of an image channel, look, change the lookup table inside the cylinder. We'll also looking, look at clipping. That's going to be the dominant topic for today is how to use shapes for clipping. We'll also autosave. Hmm, I wonder what I was trying to type there. Hmm, that's a mistake. Um, next, we will look at spheres. And for spheres, we'll do more clipping, so sort of this cutaway effect. And then for box, we will look at clipping, but we'll also look at uh, extract structured grid, which is a way of doing oblique clipping. It's really easy to do this in Dragonfly and hard everywhere else when you have a data set that requires oblique clipping. And then for uh, planes, we'll look at clipping, but also something called show data, and we'll also look at multiple planes. So that's the agenda for today. The data we are using for today come from two places. The first place is back to a data set we used in lesson one coming from the Digital Rocks portal. So if you want to use those data and you don't already have them, you can uh, go to Digital Rocks portal. This is the repository maintained at the University of Texas by Masha Pratanovich and collaborators. So you go point Google Digital Rocks portal, follow the link, go to browse published projects. The one we are are using is uh, the Berea sandstone data set from, uh, I mistyped Berea, the Berea da data set sandstone from Zulema Carpen. So not that one, but, and not that one, multiple Bereas in here. And uh, here it is, induced rough fracture in Berea sandstone. You can click view project. This is the image right here. You could download this one image right here with download file. Recall that you can also click download and download the entire 1.16 gigabyte project. That's one data set we're gonna use. The second data set that we will use today comes from a CT scan done by a collaborator at ETS in Montreal. His name is Morgan Latinier, and that data is available or will be soon available on the Dragonfly website. So if you went to theobjects.com slash Dragonfly, or if you just type ORS Dragonfly into Google, it'll be the number one hit most likely. If you come over here under learn and sample data sets, so uh, it's not up yet, but it should be up very soon. It'll be at the top and it's called cell phone or smartphone. So we're gonna use those two data sets, the induced fracture in Berea sandstone and the cell phone data set. Now moving over to Dragonfly 4.1, if you apply the customizations from lesson six, then this is what you're seeing. So let's get started. I'm going to import that Berea data set Sandstone. I'm going to go to File, Import Image Files, and I'll click Add. Uh, here we are. So in this case, it's in my Downloads folder in the Induced Rough Fracture. Here, I'll go through it with you so you can see what I mean. So once you unzip that archive that you downloaded from Digital Rocks Portal, this is what you see inside the zip file origin for original data. It's data uh, identifier 169 browsed images. Here we are, this first one right here. When you choose to open that in Dragonfly and you click the next on this page, it'll say there's no file format it recognizes, so it's going to treat it as a raw. This particular data is 1024 in X, 1024 in Y, 800 in Z, and 8-bit or unsigned char. So get those values plugged in, then hit the next button. On this page, the only thing we want to do is enter the pixel size. So if we go back here and we look at the pixel size for this image, it'll tell us it's 27.344 in X and Y. So that is 27.344 microns, 27.3 four, four microns in Y, and then in Z, it's 32.548, 32.548. We're not doing any quantitative or dimensional analysis today, so these dimensions are not critical, but it's always a good practice to have the right pixel size encoded in your data. Now, here we are looking at the 3D data, and we can, uh, I'm using, a, holding down the control button on the keyboard, 
and dragging the right mouse to change my brightness and contrast. We can do the same thing in 2D, but you know there's a button we haven't looked at yet before over on the window leveling panel. If you click this square, you can just draw, drag a square and it'll optimize the brightness and contrast. Now I'm still in this state, so if I keep dragging squares, it'll keep changing the brightness and contrast for whatever I select. But I'm gonna do this and then I'm gonna click this button right here to go back to the default track state. So here we are, we're looking at this Bria sandstone. It's in some sort of core liner or core sleeve. You can see it, if I double click here, you can see it in the two-dimensional images, what we call the NPR views. So we don't want to look at this. This is not part of our uh, in, intrinsic data set. This is just part of something that's holding the sleeve for the purpose of the scan. So we can use shapes to help us here. Now I'm gonna go over to the shapes menu here. I'm gonna click this third button. This is how you create a cylinder. If you don't see the cylinder right away, click the all button and you'll see all the objects. So sometimes you might see just like this and you click the all button and then you'll see the cylinder. Now I'm gonna turn on the visibility of the cylinder and here's a cylinder. So if you look closely, you'll see a purple outline in the 2D view and the cross section of the cylinder here is a circle and then in the orthogonal view is of course the cross section is a rectangle. Now this orientation of the cylinder is not where we need it to be so we're going to have to manipulate the cylinder. Starting with Dragonfly 2020.1, when you're on the cylinder button, there will be some buttons down here where you can just click align with Z axis or X axis or Y axis, that's quite convenient. Here we're gonna have to manipulate uh, manually. So a double click here to go full screen, middle mouse to zoom out. I'm gonna grab this vertex and I'm just gonna drag it right here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna position the vertex here. You will note that when I drag this, it's not gonna pivot about the center, it's gonna pivot about the other vertex. After you've done this two or three times, you'll find that that's actually a much easier way to manipulate your shapes. So I'm gonna grab this, I'm gonna drag it right here, and now I can drag the other vertex and position it right here. So I can, as I drag it, I'm changing the length and I'm changing the orientation. So I'll position it about right here. You'll also notice that I can change the position of the cylinder by grabbing the middle vertex. So I can drag it over here or drag it back over here. So I have repositioned it here and you can see that now it's a circle. If I double click here, I can again drag the center vertex to reposition. Now I can drag the edge of the circle to change its radius. And so I can position the center, change the radius, and now I have a cylinder. You can also manipulate it in the 3D view. So if I click on the top face, I can change the height of the cylinder, uh, likewise on the bottom face. Um, you can also rotate the cylinder, but I wanna do that right now. You can also grab the edge of the cylinder to change its radius. Now, there are different visual effects you can apply with a shape such as a cylinder. So if I come over here and I click on the cylinder, I can say I wish to apply a visual effect to one of my data objects. So in this case, I want to apply a visual effect to my induced fracture in Berea sandstone. So I'll click the check box, and now I can apply one or more visual effects. The visual effect I want to apply, we'll start with the lookup table visual effect. Now if I click on lookup table here, I can change the lookup table that's being applied inside the cylinder. So if I wanted it to appear different than everything else, you can see that everything inside the cylinder is getting that lookup table and everything outside the cylinder is getting something else. That's just an example. I'm not actually gonna use the lookup table feature today. I am gonna use the clip feature. So when I turn on the clip, you see it's now clipping the inside of the cylinder so I can see everything outside of that virtual cylinder. I could flip this so that it clips the outside. So here we are, we have masked the data. I'm gonna double click to go full screen. I'm gonna uh, adjust my brightness and contrast. If you don't know these shortcut keys, you could always click right here and adjust the brightness and contrast. So now we have a visually clipped cylinder. If I turn off the visibility of the cylinder, whoops. I turn off the visibility of the cylinder, let's click here, click this 3D button. Ah, why am I clicking that? That's not the cylinder. If I click here and turn off the visibility of the cylinder, now you can see the data and we don't see the purple cylinder. This button turns off the visibility of the cylinder in all views. This turns the toggles visibility just in the 3D view. It can be useful to have it turned off in the 3D view, so we don't see it here, but still see it here. Now I can adjust the cylinder and not have it obscuring my view. So I can still uh, translate and rotate and pivot and change the radius of my cylinder. So that is, I'm using it for uh, visual clipping. And so again, I'm just adjusting the, the, the brightness and contrast. Now, suppose I wanna add another shape. So we could add, for example, a sphere. I turn on the sphere and we now see a little sphere. Now I'm gonna position the sphere uh, on the corner down here, it doesn't really matter. And what I will do is I will turn on the sphere 
to clip, to apply a visual effect to the same data set to apply a clip, and then I'll hide this fear. And now you have sort of this cutaway, so it can be a nice way of looking inside your data but still seeing the global context. And as usual, you can still change the radius or the position. So that's another way of looking at your data. So I call those cutaways when you're doing a clip to reveal part of the data. Now, I'm going to remove that visual effect. I'm gonna turn off the sphere, and we're going to go to the uh, creating another shape. In this case, we're going to create a box. Here it is, create a box. And I'm gonna turn on the box, and in this case, we'll do all our editing in 3D. So I'm going to grab the top face, I'm gonna drag it down, I'm gonna uh, uh, go down here, and then whoops so what you can't see is i accidentally grabbed the top vertex of the box but no problem you know what you're grabbing because it's highlighted so as i position my mouse right here you see this plane is highlighted so now if i know if i click the mouse and drag it's going to reposition like that now i can always uh, adjust this in 3d so if i grab here i can just grab it and again pivot so this allows me to position the vertices uh, however i like and we're looking now at a box surrounding that fracture. Now, if I come over here and I do a visual clip again, so select that object for visual, turn on clip, and toggle to outside. Now, we are looking at the area of the fracture. If I'm interested in the fracture shape, I can't really see it because I am looking at all of the rock instead of the fracture. This is a technique you can use. You can effectively invert the lookup table or in our case, we're just going to switch our 3D lookup table. So I'm gonna select my image channel here. I'm gonna come down to 3D LUT, and I'm gonna switch from grayscale to inverted. And now we see it's showing white for the fracture. And that means if I come over here and I can drag, I can zoom. Now, if I position this more like this, then I can start to see uh, what the fracture actually looks like. So. Let's tune this in a little bit more there. Now we're looking at what this fracture shape looks like. And so we can give it a little, we can change the gamma. So that's an idea of looking at the fracture aperture, or sorry, looking at the fracture in 3D by using that inverted lookup table. If I did not have these uh, boxes restricting my field of view, so if I didn't have this clipping, so if I turn off the clipping here and I turn off the clipping on the cylinder, then this is what I'm looking at. So if your object is surrounded by a bunch of empty space, it can sort of obscure your view. So that's a good reason why inverting the lookup table alone may not be enough. You may want to invert it along with having the uh, clipping of those different shapes. All right, that's all we're gonna do for this data set. I'm gonna click the new session that's gonna effectively reset. It's gonna unload all of my data and unload all of my shapes. And I'll have, again, my Dragonfly interface that we customized yesterday. What I'll do at this point is I will load another data set. I'm gonna come over here and click the import object from file button. And I'm gonna choose this smartphone.ors object. This is the one that you'll be able to download directly from the sample data sets page. In this ORS object, you will find two things, a text overlay and a cell phone data set. So if I click OK, it will load both, both of them. So uh, it's a one gigabyte data set, so it takes just a moment to load. I will uh, do the same thing we did before in the 2D view. I'll click on this state and I'll drag a square here to sort of optimize the contrast. And then I will click here to go back to the manipulate, uh, go back to the track state. Uh, uh, I'm just going to come into this view to turn this on. So these data come from Morgan at uh, ETS, the university in Montreal, which is just a couple blocks from uh, our headquarters in Montreal. So thank you, Morgan, for providing and sharing this data set that other people can download and use for themselves. So uh, I will also adjust the brightness and contrast in the 3D view. So I can, uh, with the 3D view selected, I can adjust here. Whoops. So remember, if you grab in the window and drag, it drags the whole window. If you grab the edge, then it will uh, just adjust that. All right, so here is my cell phone. And if I come over here and I select my cell phone, there is in the property panel something called clip. If I turn on this box, and I'm also, uh, this box allows me to do clipping, but I don't want to do clipping. I don't want it re to respond to the mouse. So under this clip box, I am just gonna scroll down and click this button locked. So now it won't respond to the mouse. And if I deselect the cell phone, then uh, it'll change color. 
So what you can see in here is this 3D reconstruction of this cell phone has all these pixels in Z and X and Y, and it's quite inefficient. The cell phone is taking up very little space in this box. But if I just tried to drag these faces in, in any direction, I can't clip or crop very much without uh, eating into my cell phone. So we will use a box, a visual shape box, to actual, actually apply a, an oblique clip, which will allow us to extract out this subvolume. What I'm gonna do is I am going to create a box by clicking this button right here. It creates a box. Remember, you may have to click the All button to see it. And then I'm gonna turn on the visibility of the box. So it says box 15, but you can rename this anytime you want. So this would be my box or cell phone box or whatnot. I am going to double click in this view and I'm gonna grab this vertex. I'm gonna drag it right here to this top of the phone. I'm gonna grab this vertex and drag it right here. And I wanna get it roughly perpendicular to, uh, to this axis of the phone, you know, parallel to the different faces of the phone, but I can refine that in a minute. I'm gonna double click so that I can see this view and double click this view to go full screen. Now you can see the vertices of the box, but the vertices of the different box will project. And so you can see different vertices. I'm gonna grab the top vertex and drag it here, the bottom vertex and drag it here. So now we have, we're boxed in uh, pretty well in this dimension. And so what I can do is I can just drag in the edge of the box here and drag in the edge of the box here. And it uh, looks pretty good and you can inspect it in 3D, and uh, you know it looks like maybe I could crop in a little more in this axis before I cut into the phone, and maybe a little more in this axis. So you can play with this and get some practice and get good at this. So this is just basically applying a box. Now we haven't done any visual clipping, but if you wanted to, you can turn on uh, visual clipping uh, to this data set with the uh, crop from outside or clip from outside. So we have a box and if we look in this view, it looks like it's not quite uh, right. So, you know, we'll make some adjustments. Again, uh, you can spend as much time with this as you want. So we've, we've clipped in pretty quick, pretty closely here. Now what I can do is I can right click on my box after I've positioned it and oriented it and drawn the planes exactly where I want them. And I can come down here and choose extract structured grid. So in Dragonfly, if you have an image channel or if you have a ROI, these are sort of in the pixel domain as opposed to meshes and graphs. Those objects, image channels and ROIs and multi-ROIs, they're all something we call structured grids. So this method will work on any of those. So if I click extract structured grid, it lets me choose from all of the image channels and ROIs and multi-ROIs in my list. I only have one. And I could uh, give it a name and I could call this boxed cell phone and hit OK. And now it has, I'm going to turn off the visibility on this. Actually, I'm also going to select it and turn off its clip box. And I'm going to turn on the visibility for the boxed cell phone. And now you see I have this image channel, which is a much smaller data set. I could, of course, uh, adjust the window leveling again. And I will come back to the manipulate, uh, sorry, the track state. If you look at my initial cell phone, it is 682 by 751 by 972 pixels or 950 megabytes. The new cell phone, which has all of the same uh, spatial extent of valuable data, but none of that surrounding air, it is now only 95 megabytes. So I've thrown away 90% of the file size by just dis dis uh, well discarding all of that air. There is an interpolation introduced. So maybe during the image processing week, we can talk about what that means and whether what the what trade-offs are involved. So you don't have the exact same pixels everywhere. There is a, an interpolation anytime you're doing this sort of oblique cropping or clipping. So um, we've used a box cell phone, a box to extract. Now what I will do is I will come up here and adjust the brightness and contrast a little bit. All right, so we've got this cell phone data. Now, we have looked at boxes, we looked at cylinders, we looked at spheres briefly. There's also something called the capsule, which I won't use today, but for now I'm gonna move on to planes. So if I click a plane object, I now have uh, this plane in my workspace. If I select it, I can synchronize the plane to one of these views. Let me show you what I mean. I take the plane, let's suppose I synchronize it to this view here. If I take the plane and I say plane settings, I want the orientation to be bound to the bottom left view. I click this checkbox. 
Now this view is bound to this cross section that you see here is exactly this cross section right here. And you can change the orientation of the cross section like you normally would. So for example, if I come up here and I grab this line and I start tipping it, then you can see I'm changing the orientation of the view in the lower left. And you can see exactly where this view is coming from, from the 3D object. It's this orientation. Now, if I come up here and I drag this one down here, then you can change the oblique plane in different axes. So you have this capability of adjusting the orientation of the plane. So I'll adjust it again here and I'll adjust it here. There are easier ways to do this in a more systematic way. But we, uh, in fact, what I'll do actually is I'll, I'll hit the reset button on, on all of my planes. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take uh, this view, which is my blue view, and I'm gonna make it orthogonal to this axis of the phone. And I'm gonna take this view, my pink view, and I'm gonna make it orthogonal to this axis of the phone. Now, when I go and I try and change this green view, uh, it's a little easier to say, let's tip it right here, and, and let's make it orthogonal here, and, uh, we'll do it once more in this view. Yeah, you can spend a lot of time doing this. But what we have right now is a view that's, as I scroll through, it's mostly orthogonal, and so we can scroll through and see the, the data set. Now, what this means is if I am in this view, I zoom out with a middle drag, I can adjust this view also from, this, from the 3D view by changing the slice position or by uh, tipping the plane. So you can make those adjustments in the 3D view as well. The thing I wanted to show you here is that in addition to uh, having this virtual plane showing or this, this uh, visual shape, this visual plane showing in the 3D view, you can also use it to clip as we did before. So I can select it and say, I wanna apply a visual effect to the cell phone and do some uh, clipping. And what we will get is we'll get a 3D clip of the data set, but what you can also do, let's see, I have the data set selected and I turn on clip and clip outside, inside. I don't see a clip, I'm not sure what I've done wrong. I'm just going to delete that and create another plane very quickly and bind that plane again to the bottom left view and tell it I want to clip. Ah, well now I've done something wrong. Well, we won't get into clipping with the 2D planes, but if you do want to use clipping, uh, in fact, what we'll do one more thing, I will click this button, which will turn on the planes for all three axes. And now you can see where all three axes are at any given point. And all three, all three planes are automatically initialized and bound to the different views. So uh, if I had a plane, um, there was a feature I wanted to show. If you did turn on clipping, you could also turn on the show data button, in which case, whatever you see in these quadrant views, you'll see showing up in the 3D view there. All right. Um, so we don't have any more time and we've already covered uh, the topics I wanted to cover. So we will now shift to some questions and answers. And then we will, uh, after five minutes, we'll shift to the focus group on bone analysis for those of you that are watching live. So let's go here, let's go to Q&A and let's uh, uh, go to Q&A. So um, everyone is saying they can't see the poll. Well, uh, we'll try again tomorrow. Let me look under polls. Um, well, some of you can't say, say you can't see the poll, but 13 of you have answered the poll, so that's good. Um, it should be in the same place you find the button for Q&A. You should see a button right next to it for polls. So that's on the Zoom control panel. Um, next question is, is there a way of setting the radius of the cylinder to a specific value instead of doing it manually? That's a great question. Uh, I don't remember if that's possible in 4.1, in Dragonfly 4.1. If we create a cylinder and we select the cylinder, then down here we see its radius, but we don't see a way of dialing it in. Uh, I'm pretty sure that there's a updated property panel in Dragonfly 2020.1 where you can dial in a specific radius. Uh, so it's not available in 4.1, but it is in the next release. So next question, is there a way of, okay, that's the question I just answered. Can I manipulate the shapes without dragging the faces? For example, keeping them 90 degrees exactly. Um, the, 
manipulate the shapes without dragging the faces. I, maybe you mean you want them to be 90 degrees with respect to some other object? No, I don't think there's a way of constraining that, but you may have to ask that question offline. I'm not sure uh, what you want to do, but basically in 4.1, you can drag in 2D and 3D to change the orientation of the shape. And in Dragonfly 2020.1, you can in fact uh, uh, dial in a specific axis. So an X axis or Y axis or Z axis of any data set. Next question, what if your data set was not a simple shape, such as a box or cylinder, how would you clip that data set? Uh, that's a good question. You can do that um, with a segmentation. So I'll maybe show that briefly. So I'm gonna hit the reset button here. If I have a ROI, so I'm gonna create a new ROI. This is gonna be called example. If you happen to do some painting with that ROI, and we'll look at that this week. So if I'm gonna turn on the 3D paintbrush, and I'm gonna paint these pixels right here. Now, uh, if you wanna see what this looks like, uh, you can see I've painted, let's see, where are those pixels? Turn on 3D and let's turn up the highlight. Maybe, well, let's get rid of all these shapes for now. And uh, let's turn off example because I bound it to the cell phone rather than the boxed cell phone. This might be easier in my workspace if I create the ROI and make sure it's linked to the boxed cell phone. Should work either way, but I don't want to do any troubleshooting on it right now. So uh, if I turn on uh, ROI painter, let's come in this view so I can turn on ROI painter. And now we select uh, something like this. And all right, so you see that painting right there. I can use the ROI itself to do clipping. So in fact, it does that by default with uh, clipping is already enabled in the ROI. And that's effectively what's happening here. If I turn down the data set, then we are seeing uh, only what is, uh, is clipped by that particular ROI, what, exactly what I painted. So you can have a completely custom segmentation that has nothing to do with the shape that's all based on your segmentation and ROI, and that can be used for clipping. Next question is from shapes or from crops that are not perpendicular to the XYZ axes of the image stacks, can you export image slices that are aligned with the orientation of the shape? Uh, yes, so you don't actually use shapes for that. So if I uh, did a reset here, that's a great question by the way. Um, if I have my image channel and let's do this, um, I'm going to work in the green view. Let's start by, uh, let's take this view and let's make this view this view like here and this view right here and now what let's see how i want to do this i want to i want to adjust the green view so that it uh is orthogonal and i'm just tipping the the view to get a a useful orientation and we'll drag this right here let me look and drag this uh, just, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but if we pick a particular orientation that we like, and let me do this once more, uh, yeah, and I, could, should, I should do a separate lesson on this, on how to set these orientations, because it's not as hard as I'm making it look. But let's suppose I had the orientation I wanted and I wanted to re-slice this, and then I can come up here and I can take this view and I can right click this data set and let's see, I can derive new from current view and this will create a new image channel. I'll just go ahead and click the button. So it'll create a new image channel and now it's sliced along this axis. So it'll be a new 196 slice data set uh, in that orientation. So it's now 581 by 924 by 196. So it's in this new orientation looking like this and then you could right click and save that ORS object or save it as a stack of TIFFs. Sorry, that was a long answer. Um, let's see if I can answer two more questions. Is it possible to rotate and crop the images during data import? It is possible to crop. It is not possible to rotate during import. 
And then uh, one other user says he only sees the options to raise hand and chat and Q&A, doesn't see polls. It could be that if you're connecting from some platforms, maybe if it's a, it's a phone platform or maybe it's a Chromebook platform, maybe it's not showing you the polls option. Let's take one more question. From shapes or crops that are not perpendicular, I think we already answered that question. Uh, can we make a half cylinder or an oblique cutting of it, for example, to follow the surface of a fracture. I do not see how an oblique fracture would follow the surface, how an oblique cylinder would follow the fracture uh, surface. But uh, you, can, you can't make a half cylinder, but you can clip with a cylinder and you can also clip with a box at the same time and that would give you a half cylinder. All right, that's it for the questions and answers today. So uh, please look, look for this on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. Please hit the like button if you made it this far. And then look forward to lesson number eight, working with ROI tools. So we're gonna dig in the next three lessons, eight, nine, and 10, we're gonna dig into image segmentation. So look for those videos either live or on YouTube. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for tuning in and uh, come back tomorrow and hear, hear all about segmentation uh, for the next three lessons. All right, thanks everybody. Stay healthy. Have a good week. See you tomorrow.